Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wasn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. You're going to have to forgive my sitting down this morning. I, uh, I think this will work. We'll see. Yeah, if you'll turn that just a little bit. Okay, I think, I think that'll work. Just bring it a little bit closer. There we go. That's perfect. Hallelujah. I won't forget that that's there. I'll try not to stand up. <laughs> I uh, had some fun this week. And uh, no, I'm not trying to get attention because it's Pastor Appreciation Month. I'm just... <laughs> it is. Isn't it that great? But uh, Judy... Uh, so good to have Judy with us this morning. Uh, Greg's mom is with us all the way from California. And, uh, you know, she, she was in the ministry for, for years, and she said, isn't it like us to want to get sympathy, right? Isn't that what we're looking to do? She said something like that this morning. But, uh, no, I, uh, for years, have had this weird thing in my knee that would flare up, and, uh, just, you know, it'd flare up for a couple of days, then it'd get better, and so I'd get over it. And uh, so Friday was one of those days it flared up, and I'm like, what in the heck is this? And so it just got worse and worse. And then my sweet seven-year-old was laying on the ground in our bedroom, and, uh, you know, unbeknownst to her, I was walking past her. She flailed her leg in the air and kicked me right in the knee, uh, right where it was hurting, and I hit the ground, and uh, my, ear, my, my eyes started to sweat a little bit, and... Um, this strange liquid began to pour out of my eyes, and I couldn't get off the ground. And so I laid there for a while, laid there for a while, and I thought, it's not getting better. And the kids prayed for me, and it wasn't getting better. And so finally I said, Danny, you're going to have to take me to the ER, because uh, this just isn't getting better, and I, don't, I, I can't live with this pain. This is just this is worse uh, than any pain I'd ever experienced. And so we went, and uh, she dropped me off, and I sat there. And uh, then finally, they moved me to the back, and we got some x-rays. And what they discovered uh, was that there's a two-and-a-half-centimeter lesion in the bone. Uh, so there's this, this thing in the bone there uh, that he said had obviously been there for years, uh, but the, the kick to the knee exacerbated it. And uh, so I'm going to go see the orthopedic surgeon on Tuesday and see what he has to say. Uh, but I'm just believing God for healing. I don't have time for this, y'all. Um, I've got too much to do. And uh, so for now, they've got me in this, you know, super suit here. Uh, I'm supposed to use crutches, but those things are annoying. And uh, so as long as I have things around to grasp a hold of, I do that. If I'm outside, I'll use the crutches. Um, so I'm going to try and preach sitting down. But if you know me, I move a lot. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, I think that's why it's turned this way to keep me locked in so I don't walk around this morning. It's weird to sit down to preach, though. I feel like I'm, I'm locked in. I feel uh, maybe how Paul felt when he was in prison. No, really nothing close to that. I mean, and uh, the trouble is that when I sit down, I think I'm a comedian. So we'll see what happens this morning. I, I don't know. Just pray for me. Turn to your Bibles, Matthew chapter 25. That's where we're going to start this morning. We're in part eight uh, on the kingdom of God. And uh, we're going to broach a subject this morning. Uh, I'm not going to uh, try and give you my opinion on theology this morning. I'm going to present some perspectives uh, concerning a topic this morning, and we'll see where we go. Amen? Matthew chapter 25, uh, verses 1 through 13. And Greg, I'm going to need a favor. I'm going to need you to turn these lights down because I can't even see my Bible. I'm used to being up there where they're not as bright, and uh, praise the Lord. Um, you know what? I don't care about the live stream. Just cut them. Just get rid of them. Yes, thank you. God bless you. Greg is saved back there. He has an anointing to help me this morning. All right, Matthew chapter 25. We're going to begin in verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be, will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. I want you to notice something there. They all got drowsy. All right, all ten of them got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout. 
Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I don't know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. There are so many pictures and descriptions given in the New Testament regarding the kingdom of God. We've been talking about that for weeks, the kingdom of God. We've been talking about rulership. We've been talking about coming under the rulership of Christ so that one day we might rule with Him. And each one of them expands our understanding of the kingdom of God. And I think one of the greatest is this passage here where it likens the kingdom of God, describing the kingdom of God as a wedding or a marriage. Now, how many men in the room want to be called the bride of Christ? I, I don't think any of... We, we've got one who's caught the revelation this morning. Hallelujah. But I, I don't think, you know, as men, uh, especially, we think of ourselves dressed in a wedding dress. Amen. And, uh, you know, in this, though, it it compares it to this wedding and this marriage, the bridegroom coming. We see the same thing. We'll look at Matthew 22 later, where he compares the kingdom of God to a wedding feast put on by a king. And all of these are kingdom parables. You know, Jesus taught parables not to reveal the truth, but actually to hide the truth. That the parables were meant as an invitation to come into understanding, to come on a journey with him. And the Bible says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. So every parable that Jesus teaches is an invitation to understand his glory in a way that you never understood before and to understand his kingdom in a way that you never understood before. But he doesn't speak it plainly. He speaks it in parables as an invitation. Now, the other passage I want to look at this morning is probably uh, from one of the most undervalued books in the Bible because, unfortunately, for many in the body of Christ, it's been used as a tool of fear-mongering, and that is the book of Revelation. People, I, I meet them all the time. They say, I'm afraid of the book of Revelations. Well, you know, it is the only book in the Bible that ascribes a blessing to it for reading it. Blessed are you when you read the words of this book. That there is a blessing, and that word blessing there doesn't just mean, oh, good gifts. It actually means, that word blessing in the Greek means, that there's actually an anointing from the Father that is placed on your life when you catch the revelation of Jesus Christ revealed in the book of Revelation. So it shouldn't be a book that we're afraid of. It's actually an invitation again, another invitation to understand Jesus in a way that we couldn't unless we read the words of the book. So turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 19, and there is blessing, again, attached to reading the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Here is in Revelation 19, one of the greatest events that will take place in history. A marriage takes place with a bride who has made herself ready. Following the marriage, a glorious wedding feast, a wedding supper that is a great blessing to be invited to and to partake of, the marriage supper of the Lamb. I mean, I want you to get this picture in your head this morning that you and I are being invited to this this 
kind of culmination of human history, and this thing is not going to work for me. We have been invited to the culmination of human history where the perfected bride of Christ will be wed to her bridegroom in a dispensation of time out. Yeah, get rid of it, Hector. It's not going to work. And we are going to be married to the Lord Jesus Christ as his perfected church. And I think for too long... The American and Western church has overlooked this reality and have missed out on one of the greatest factors of the gospel of the kingdom, that it is not just the gospel of salvation, it is the gospel of the kingdom. And we are not to be ashamed of this gospel, for in the gospel is the power to save, and that part of this great and glorious gospel is the return of the great and glorious king in preparation for a wedding feast. I mean, come on, somebody. I mean, the Scripture with great anticipation and excitement anticipates this event. Ephesians chapter 5 speaks of a marriage referring to this event. It speaks about Christ who loved the church, who gave Himself up for Him. I didn't put this one in the notes, Mike, so if you look for it, you won't find it. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. It says that he might present to himself the church. Do you get this? Jesus is working on you to present you to himself. He's working on us to present us to himself. It says, in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and blameless. And he calls this the great mystery. I mean, can you, I I need you to really grasp this this morning, church, because we're going to apply this to the kingdom of God, because it's so essential for us to have an understanding of the age to come and what is to come in that time. Because if you'll begin to live for that dispensation of time in this dispensation of time, it will change your character. It will change your behavior. It will change your attitude because you realize you're not living for the here and now. You're actually driven by eternity. We, we have too much of a habit in the Western church of living for the here and now. What makes me feel good now? Well, listen, what makes you feel good now isn't going to make you feel good then. <laughs> Can we just get a reality check there? That living for the pleasures of temporal comfort will do us no good in eternity's scope? It, it won't prepare us. See, Jesus will have a marriage with a company of people who are perfected, fully matured, and fully clothed with the glory of God. You are in the process of being clothed in the glory of God. These present sufferings compare not to the glory that we will behold in that day. Our sufferings of this season of time, our sufferings in this dispensation of time, whether we see it with our eyes then or we have to wait until His glorious return, these present sufferings do not compare to the glory that He has prepared for His bride. And so we can get into some theological discussions about the end times all day and every day. We, we could. We can try and figure it out. Let me tell you, we're all going to be wrong in the end. Like, we will probably all have a, a, a portion of it correct. We'll all probably have a portion of it figured out. But when he actually does it, it's going to shock us all. Can we just get that down? It is difficult to develop a theology on something that's never happened. Like, can we just get real about that? I have spent hours and hours and hours in tumult and, and some, some great spiritual pain trying to figure this all out. And for years, I avoided it. Can I also get real about that? For years, I was like, I'm not going to try. This is just too com- I'm just going to preach the kingdom in a very small way. But you can't actually preach the kingdom without preaching his return. Like, like you can't do it. And so all these, these movements who are trying to preach the kingdom, they dumb it down to a few couple verses that actually doesn't preach the whole counsel of the word of God. And so as we dive into it, there are three schools of thought when it comes to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going to do my best to try and break them down quickly and try to give you an explanation, but it really isn't that important to where we're headed this morning, but it is important that I try and lay a little bit of a foundation theologically to this. 
So there are three schools of thought. The first school of thought, there, there's more than that, but for the context of this, three schools of thought. There is a pre-tribulation thought. Pre-tribulation supposes that before any tribulation hits the earth, before the revealing of the Antichrist, before any of that happens, the church is caught up in the air in a, a silent disappearing. All of their clothes are left behind, and everyone left on earth is left to the suffering of the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation for a period of seven years. All right, that's the first school of thought. How many have ever heard that one before? Anyone ever seen the Left Behind series? All, all of that, okay? I'm going to be very forthcoming. I don't believe that school of thought. I think that it causes escapism in the church, and it causes the Western church to feel like they are exempt from suffering. That, that, is, my, that is where my opinion is, all right? So we'll, we'll leave that there. The second is a mid-tribulation rapture, or a secret appearing of Christ in the middle of the tribulation. That Jesus will come in a secret appearing in, you know, once the Antichrist has been revealed, there will be a period of three and a half years of tribulation. In the middle of that, there will be a thief in the night, as First Thessalonians says. And at the midnight hour, that cry will be heard. Behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. And for those ready and listening, they will respond. They will enter the marriage and the feast, leaving outside those believers who are unprepared. So this is a mid-tribulation thought, that there will be a separating the sheep from the goats, the ready and the not ready, the prudent and the foolish. So this is that, that mid-trib, leaving those outside that will go through the greatest darkness to ever touch the earth, the great tribulation, and that indeed for them, they are the ones who experience that weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's that second school of thought. The third school of thought would be a post-tribulation return of Christ. doesn't include a rapture per se, but it includes a return of Christ where all of creation on the earth at that time will see him and it will be a visible return and the church will meet him in the air. They'll make a victory march around the earth and Jesus will set up his throne. Those are the three schools of thought. All clear? I'm in teaching mode right now. Checking for understanding, right? I'm not going to ask questions this morning. If I were in my classroom, I would have. So in that mid-trib thought, it's that at the end of the three and a half years, Christ comes back in his glorious second coming. What we do know for sure is he is coming back. And when he returns, it will be a glorious coming. Because 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So what we do know is when he returns, it will be a glorious returning. All in preparation for what I feel is one of the greatest moments in all of human history, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in many respects, this marriage is going to be one of those greatest events. So let's look at another passage in Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to read about 17 verses here. Bear with me. It's good to read the Bible in church. I heard a preacher the other day. I don't even want to call him a preacher. He was a motivational speaker. Say, all these preachers who use so much scripture in their messages, they need to dumb it down for people. I thought, you need to get saved. That's what needs to happen. If we don't value and love the Word of God. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days." Aren't these pictures so wonderful? I mean, it's just so, I mean, it's just, it's better than any movie. It's better than Avatar. I mean, it's just great. 
And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels war, waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, and I love this, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And here's the most important part. And they did not love their life, even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time and a time and a half from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. How many of you know exactly what that means? Right. Maybe a couple of us have an idea. We have never seen it play out in human history. So none of us have a total clue on what exactly this all means. <clears throat> it's going to be glorious, though. Fun to watch. But let's try and break some of it down for just a minute. Verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. As I've studied this out, as I've listened to different uh, Greek scholars and Hebrew scholars and different schools of thought, the common picture here that is understood is that this woman mentioned here is the bride of Christ. That she is the bride clothed in the glory of God, the glory of the Father, the supreme source of all light and power. That this moon representing a reflection of the glory of the sun. That all of this is the bride clothed in, in God's glory. Verse 2, and she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Following this marriage, there is this, this consummation. There's something birthed here. There are two other man-childs mentioned in Scripture, Moses and Jesus. They're the only other two mentioned in Scripture, both of whom wrought a great deliverance for the children of God. So in this period of time, in this dispensation of time where the great serpent is released and we see all of this happening, we understand that God will still release a deliverance for His people. We understand that, that, that we see this, that the enemy appears, the devil himself appears, knowing that the birth of this man-child would cause great conflict to his kingdom, and he sought to destroy the child. But God intervenes. He takes the child up to heaven. Then the woman, the bride, taken into a place of provision during the tribulation. So whether you are a mid-tribber or a post-tribber, here is one thing we understand, is that God makes provision for his bride in the midst of tribulation. Even though we will be persecuted, even though we go through trials and tribulation, we understand this truth that God always makes provision for His bride. So in verses 7 to 17, we see this great war taking place. Satan's cast to earth. Such is his anger. He seeks to destroy the bride, but he's unable to. The enemy cannot destroy the bride of Christ. You've got to get that in your spirit this morning. That the bride and the subsequent marriage to Christ that precipitates some of these events, that there is a purpose in describing all of this, to lay emphasis on the fact of this bride, a company of people who will wed Christ, a company of people who will be involved in significant end-time events, a company of people who are warriors, a warrior bride, a kingdom of God company. You need to understand that church that you are being prepared for the greatest end time events ever to happen and you are being prepared as a bride and a warrior all in one. 
We're not some weakling bride who sits on clouds and plays harps and does floral arrangements. I think we have, for lack of better terms, effeminized the bride of Christ. We've made this picture of the bride of Christ just this beautiful wedding. Yes, that's part of it. But it is a warrior bride. It is a bride who is not afraid to fight. It's a bride, it's a bride who's not afraid of blood and war and all of those things because they overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And the testimony is they did not love their life even unto death. A bride on her wedding day doesn't think about her death, but the bride of Christ is willing to lay their life down for the name and the cause of the kingdom of God. So we can't effeminize this thing. We can't make it some weakling thing. We can't make it some some weak bride that just sits around and does nothing waiting to escape. You're a warrior. I meant to put up this picture I saw years ago. It was this beautiful wedding dress and combat boots. Like, you got to get that picture. You are dressed for battle. In the glory. You're not clothed in a dress. You're clothed in the glory of King Jesus. That is your attire, is His glory. And so you are a kingdom of God company. A people being raised up in this hour. And Matthew 22 and Matthew 25 compares the kingdom to a marriage and subsequent feast. And I want to read another long passage this morning. It's good for you. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. Matthew 22, verse 1. We're going to read this parable. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of God may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. We'll talk about that. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways. Another translation says, go to the highways and the byways. And as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out in the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. Y'all get that? And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to them, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. My God. The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. How many of you know we have a king who is preparing a wedding feast for his son? And he has sent out his spirit into the highways and the byways to bid you to come. The guests, us, the church. The Holy Spirit has been sent to make us witnesses of the coming wedding feast. All of whom who have been invited to this feast. But what is the problem we see in this parable? They simply refused to come. Maybe there's been a misunderstanding. Maybe the message has not gotten through. Maybe the guests thought this was the save the date and the actual feast was later on. Who knows? But they had been invited and they refused to come. But the king, he continues to persist. The message of the king does not stop. Come. Tell those who've been invited, behold, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. The king persists with this detailed message, leaving no doubt that things were ready. He's been readying the wedding feast for 2,000 years. He's been readying this wedding feast and the call is still the same. Bid them come. 
And here is the first principle that you need to understand that God in his mercy repeatedly pleads our attendance at his marriage feast. The marriage is so important to the heart of God. He wants no one to miss out. So he sends his spirit out to woo us to his marriage. In a real sense, God is courting his church. You need to understand the signs and wonders, they're pre-wedding gifts. They're a sign of the age to come. Everything he does in this dispensation of time is the king wooing us. He's saying, get ready, get prepared. I'm doing this in a here and now as a preparation of what is to come in that age. He's courting us, working on his church in preparation for this great day. As we will continually see, God expects us to be prepared for that day, to be properly clothed. And he gives us repeated opportunity to prepare ourselves. He's even prepared to give us the benefit of the doubt. The first refusal, maybe they misunderstood. Maybe they didn't get the picture. Maybe they don't understand. And such is his mercy and love towards us that he gives us another opportunity. How many of you know our God is the God of the second chance? He's the God of the second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance, the fifth chance. He'll keep giving you chances until that day. And so often in Scripture, the purposes of God for individuals and nations are missed on the first call. We see it with Israel time and time again. They kept missing. How many of you know His call to Israel still stands? It still stands. He will redeem His people Israel. He will call them back. And you know how He does it? He makes them jealous through you and I. He's making Israel jealous because we have inherited a promise that belonged to them. And he's making them jealous. They will look on the Gentile believer and go, how did you get what belonged to me? And we get to tell them because we understood who the Messiah was. We got the picture. He will redeem Israel. Don't believe those preachers that say Israel has nothing to do with it. They're liars. So he comes the second time. We see it with Jonah. The second opportunity to respond to the call of God. Listen, you might end up in the belly of your own well. You might end up in hell in this life. But he will give you chance and chance again to heed the call. I've been to my own belly of the well. We can all go to our moment in life. If you're walking with Christ now, you, can, you know when you got saved. If you don't know when you got saved, brother, sister, you need to get saved today. All right, if you don't know that you're saved, I'll give you an opportunity in just a little bit to make that decision. But let me tell you, if you've walked with Christ for any time, you know where you got your second chance, your third chance, your fourth chance. You know where he kept calling your name. And he keeps calling. He keeps inviting. We see it with Elijah. He had a second opportunity to break through his negativity. We see it with Joseph's brothers the second time when Joseph was revealed as their brother. He is the God of the second chance. And he comes again to us and renews his call for our lives. He again woos us to his purpose. He says, come on, it's not too late. Pick up the call of God again. God provides us with every opportunity to come again into his perfect purpose. Sometimes he does it in ways we don't like. Anyone ever been there? Pastor Anna and I can tell you in 2013, I said, I'm never going to church again. I don't believe in the organized church. I don't believe in buildings. I don't and I'm not doing it. And you know what God did at the end of 2013? Called me to pastor this church. Okay. Challenge accepted, Jacob. He calls and 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 he keeps calling and the invitation still stands. Don't miss the invitation. And this theme recurs with the parable of the man with the vineyard who rented it out and sent his servants back to receive some of the produce. And in each instant, they were mistreated. And finally, he sent his own son and they were killed. And the principle is this, is that he keeps sending his servants, giving repeated opportunity to respond. He will keep giving opportunities. In Matthew 22, verse 5, it says, But they paid no attention and went their own way, one to his own farm, another to his business. What were their excuses for not responding? I've got things to take care of. This has to be probably the most significant thing as we look towards the last days where humanism rules. Where it's all about self. 
It's all about living your best life now. It's all about becoming the best version of yourself. Listen, even on my best day, the best version of myself is still like filthy rags. All right, my righteousness will never be righteous without His righteousness. So I can't become the best version of myself unless I become like Him and I reflect Him. He is the best version of me. It's becoming like Him. And we see in our day and in our hour preachers who promote self-interest and self-need where their desires, their enjoyments, and their aims were central. Now listen, I believe that God takes pleasure in the prosperity of His people. That's what His Word says. I believe that God takes good pleasure in giving us the kingdom. But let me tell you, it's a controversial kingdom because it's a kingdom that doesn't leave you the same. It's a kingdom that makes you like Him. So your priorities change. Your desires change. It's not about just, oh, I just, listen, can I tell you, I'd love a Mercedes G-Wagon. I'd love one, okay? But you know what? I laid it on the altar because it's not about that. It's not about building my kingdom and building my wealth and building those things. It's about building His kingdom. It's about demonstrating His kingdom. Because you know what? In His kingdom, there is joy forevermore that is everlasting. There is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. If I think that in this dispensation of time that God is just about making me comfortable, I need to go apologize to my brothers and sisters in China who are suffering and persecuted for the gospel. We've grown so comfortable in the Western church. Why? Because we've stopped preaching this. We've stopped preaching the return of the Lord. We've started preaching these messages of of gospel prosperity and positivity and just making yourself the best version of you. That's not what it's about, church. Because when we preach those things, we become self-ruled. And we rule from ourself. And the result is that we actually end up as dead men. Without an inheritance. Without the right clothes on. And the result of this this issue is that the people. And here's the issue. And I'm going to tell you this is the issue in the Western church. Is that when the return of the Lord is preached. It's offensive to the hearer. In our Western culture. And what happens is, is in verse 6, it says, The rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. And I have met so many people from a, 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 a preterist point of view, even a partialist preterist point of view that says the return of the Lord is not happening, that actually end up with murder in their heart towards those who preach on the return of the Lord. Because they say, you can't preach that. That means that my children might have to suffer. Listen, they might. Can I just tell you that the reality of the gospel is your children might have to suffer for the gospel. You might have to suffer for the gospel. You might be arrested for preaching Jesus. Owning one of these books might become illegal in our country someday. And if you're not prepared to suffer for the gospel, this isn't fear mongering. This is the truth of the gospel that for 2000 years, people have been beheaded for what's in this book. And we think we have a legal right to prevent that in America. My God, we've become deceived. We have to understand that as much as we are in conflict with spiritual forces, we are also in conflict with ourselves and our own self-interest. And that more people will find themselves disqualified through self-gaining control than through any other conflict. That when we rule ourselves from our flesh, that is where we disqualify ourselves, church. So here's the second principle you must understand. We must learn to overcome the battle of self versus the wooing of God. Dying to self that God requires. It's a requirement that we die to self. Now, I'm not talking about being the sour sucking intercessors I grew up with. You don't have to walk around depressed because you have to die to self. Actually, when you die to self, you find more joy than you ever could have found. There, there's a greater contentment in dying to self because I learned to live dependent on His presence. And there is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Amen. But we have to die to self. Verse 7 of Matthew 22 says, But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers. Those who preach against the return of the Lord will suffer a greater judgment. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. 
And the words will ring through loud and clear. Those who were invited were not worthy. So he says in verse 9, Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves were sent out into the streets, gathered together. All they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. So the Holy Spirit continues His work, wooing and calling and drawing from the world, and many respond. But here's something that's so interesting. In verse 11 it says, But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, How did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot. This seems so harsh, y'all. I I read this and I'm like, man, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Here is the remarkable scene. So many have been invited in, but they've not been properly clothed. Who was it the responsibility of to get them properly closed? Those who were inviting. This is why the Western church has failed in discipleship. We've made it about converts and not disciples. We've, we've preached a gospel. Just pray a prayer. You're saved. But there's no discipleship. There's no getting them properly clothed for the feast. That's what discipleship is all about. Let's change your clothes. Not just an outward thing. If you grew up like me, there was some legalism attached to Pentecost. You looked a certain way and that made you holy. That's not what makes you holy. I don't care if you... Listen, some barns need painting. Can we just get real about it, right? Holiness is not what you wear. It's who you are. It's what Christ does. That Christ be formed in you. And so here's this remarkable scene. The king looks over all who come. And in tradition, because of the shortness of time, the poor nature of the attendees, the king would have provided garments. You understand that? that The king would have had garments ready for them to change into before they entered the wedding feast. It was available and ready. It was the nature in that tradition as I've studied this out and I've looked at it. Anytime a wedding had to be prepared, be prepared on short notice, and those who didn't know the family were invited, the king would have provided clothes for them to wear. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, not only did they invite them, they had clothes ready for them. And they weren't just cheap clothes. It would have been fine linens from the king's closet that they could wear to this wedding feast. And yet he finds that someone wasn't dressed appropriately. Wait a second. I invited you. I made everything available for you. What are you doing here not ready? And the warning to us is this. We're being wooed to this great feast. Yet we must be prepared. We must be clothed. And even if the call has come to you late in life, even if it seems you didn't have the time to prepare and make yourself ready, we must be clothed. And the encouragement is this. God will provide that clothing for you. He's already made it available for us. He lets us know what that clothing is. In Revelation 19, speaking of this marriage of Christ and the bride, he tells us what the clothing is. It says the clothing is the righteous acts of the saints. The clothing that we're called to wear is the righteous acts of the saints. And this is where we link this into the teaching on the kingdom of God. What was the qualification in Matthew in the parable of the talents? Our works. We talked about that last week. Faithfulness to do business till the master returns. You want to wear the right clothes to the wedding? Do the works of the master till he returns because that's the clothing that you wear. Salvation is free. The invitation's free. Amen? We're saved by grace and grace alone lest any man should boast. But the clothing that we wear to the wedding feast is the righteous acts of the saints. Where God matches ability with responsibility and requires us to be faithful to His calling and His gifting in our lives. Where God expects that our works stand the test and judgment of God. Our acts, our righteous acts and works, not done for self-promotion, but to promote and extend the purposes of God. And here is the key regarding works that don't burn in the fire of God testing. They must be righteous. What is a righteous act? It is an act that promotes and glorifies God and not yourself. We have too many people in this hour who are looking for ministry opportunities to promote themselves. We have too many people in this hour, they're looking to build works for their own glory. 
They're building their own kingdoms on their own name. Let us not build our ministries on our name. Let it be built to the glory and the name of Jesus. That our lives would be a testimony that we would be clothed in His glory. That when people look at us, they don't see Jacob, they see Jesus. That we are a reflection of Him. That is the call. So the third principle is this, we must clothe ourselves with acts that give God the glory and not ourselves. Verse 13 says, Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Man, that seems like harsh judgment, right? The judgment comes, this place of outer darkness, a place of deep regret having come to the realization that he missed God's best. We read the parable of the ten virgins. We're going to talk about that more next week. But what is the saddest thing? They all fell asleep waiting for the king to come. But half of them, they were still preparing. Even though they grew tired, what does the Bible says? Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't grow tired in waiting for him to come. He will make good on his promise. He will return. Keep your lamps trimmed. Keep the oil, keep the relationship with the Holy Spirit alive and active in your life. Because when He comes, He will look to see, are you full? Do you have the oil? Or have you allowed your oil to run out? What is the oil that runs out? We're going to talk about it more next week. But the oil that runs out is the works that you do in your flesh that are not empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we have half of these virgins waiting for their bridegroom who kept working the righteous acts and the other half unrighteous acts running out of oil. Many are called, but few are chosen. That has nothing. Let me make this clear. I can't stand when I hear preachers use that verse to qualify you for ministry. Many are called, but few are chosen. I've discovered you're disqualified to serve in our ministry. Nah, that is rubbish. That has nothing to do with what this is talking about. What it has to do with is those who will make it to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Are you clothed in righteous works? I'm going to close. Ben, will you come play for me? Many are called. The problem, only a few are chosen because only a few seek to qualify and clothe themselves appropriately. We spend so much time trying to clothe ourselves in our own works. Listen, it's the finished work of the cross that qualifies you. It's the works of Christ that qualify you. So all that remains are a few questions. Are we allowing ourselves to be wooed? Are we heeding the call of Christ to continue to be wooed by His presence? Are we seeking to put on that garment appropriate to the wedding feast? Are we seeking to glorify God in all that we do versus the promotion of self? I fear that we have a generation that have become so enamored with themselves. We have a TikTok generation, a selfie generation. It's all about me. I want to look my best. I want, the, I want the best version of me. But at the end of the day, all of that gets burned up. Only that which remains will be that which is a reflection of the King. The clothes that He has provided, the righteous acts of the saints. And the question that you have to ask yourself, church, am I building my own kingdom or am I building the kingdom of God? Many will come to Him and say, but I cast out devils in your name. I did signs and wonders in your name. Yeah, but they were unrighteous. They were done for yourself. I don't don't know you. But we had lamps. But they weren't full. This isn't fear, church. I'm afraid that we've called accountability fear-mongering. I'm afraid that we've called accountability judgment. Don't judge me. 
How many have ever heard that phrase? How many have ever used that phrase? I fear that we've redefined judgment to mean accountability. And that we look at accountability as a form of judgment. Well, actually it is. It's righteous judgment. It's looking at the fruit hanging on our trees and going, is it good fruit? Is it lasting fruit? Or will this be burned up? Church, I, th- I think that we're, we're in a dispensation of time. We're, we have multiple generations looking to men as their answers. Donald Trump isn't the answer for America. Neither is Ron DeSantis. Neither is any of the other ones running. Do I believe in the American duty of voting? Absolutely. Do I think we should? Yeah. Do I think we should vote for righteousness? Yeah. Do I think we should vote for life? Yeah. I can't support a candidate who will kill children. I can't do it. I don't care if they're... Listen, I'm ashamed of the fact that Donald Trump said that we should continue abortions. He said it. He said, it's okay, let it keep happening. Because he's pandering to a group that he knows won't vote for him unless he supports abortion. So he's willing to acquiesce. But you know what? All of them, every single one of those Republicans and Democrats have acquiesced to something and compromised in some area. That's why they're not the solution. The kingdoms of this world, all right? You cannot save Babylon. Babylon gets destroyed. You got to understand that. I think I said it Thursday night. I'm not concerned about the seven mountains of culture and society. I'm concerned about one mountain. That's the Mount of Olives. And when Jesus sets his foot there, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. It's not going to be a race of super Christians who invade society. It's going to be the king of kings coming that will change society ultimately. We can read scripture. No, the world will get darker. It will. But where grace, where sin abounds, grace abounds greater. There's a grace to sustain you through every tribulation, trial, and dark time. And I'm telling you, church, it's time that we we examine ourselves. Am I wearing the clothing that I'm to be wearing? Am I doing what he's called me to do? Am I allowing him to woo me to the marriage supper? Am I being perfected? Am I allowing sanctification in my life? One not ought to think too highly of himself. We have people who who live off of prophetic flattery. They live off of thinking, oh, I'll I'll just go do my own thing. Listen, this isn't an hour to disconnect from the body. You need the body of Christ. You need a healthy one. You don't need some of these places that I think, my God, it's Babylon itself. I try not to be a heresy hunter, y'all. I really do. I just can't help it when the video comes across the screen and I hear some of these pimps. I mean, that's what they are. They're just prostituting prosperity all in the name of Jesus. And it's disgusting. God help the American church. But let me also say this. Because I can get pretty critical of the American church. There's a word in there that's really important. Church. It's still His church. As messy as it is. As messy as it is. He loves His church. And He's working on her. He's working on her. And I, I believe that the best days of the church are ahead. I really believe that. I I really, truly believe that, that God will have a people. And so, yeah, we can get real heavy and talk about all the issues in the church. But let me also tell you that Christ will have his church. She's being perfected. And a glorious bride she will be. And that's a reason to rejoice. That's a reason to rejoice because he will have his people. He will have a people 
sanctified and glorified and perfected in that day. And what a day it will be. Amen. Welcome and thanks for tuning in to this week's life-changing message from the Equipping Church. My name is Pastor Jacob Biswell and I have the wonderful privilege of leading the Equipping Church here in Bryan, Texas, where we exist to win the lost and equip the same. By tuning in this week, we have a couple of hopes for you. That number one, you'd encounter the Lord, that you'd be equipped by his word, and then you would take that word and extend his kingdom wherever you go. For more information, you can visit us online at www.equippingchurch.us. Thanks and God bless you. We hope to see you in person soon.